Welcome to another Down the Rabbit Hole video. I'm going to do another Blade Runner video because people really like these and last time I actually reviewed the original film, the original theatrical cut, and it reminded me I actually have this in my collection. Uh, the Marvel Super Special from 1982, Blade Runner, the official adaptation of the film. And I thought, you know, I've never actually read this. And this movie, this video of mine might be a little lengthy, but um, I'm going to kind of go through this. I may not read every single page because it's quite lengthy, but oh, it's got some nice stuff at the end. Um, I've never actually read this. Uh, I didn't actually own this originally. Um, a friend of mine had this from my high school days. He bought it back in the day. And when uh, he was moving away, he was going through his old stuff and he said, hey, you like Blade Runner. Do you want this comic book? I said, yeah, sure. And it has sat on a shelf for decades. Never actually read it. So it'll be interesting to compare this since I know the original theatrical cut very well. How does this official adaptation uh, kind of match up to that? So I'm going to read it now, whether or not I read the entire thing page. I'm going to read it page by page. Whether I'm going to show you that, I don't know. It looks like it's got pretty nice artwork in here. But you might get tired after page 70 or 80. So uh, I think I may edit this. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. But let's make a start on Marvel's Super Special from 1982, Blade Runner, the official adaptation of the new science fiction thriller. It even begins off with Stan Lee Presents. That's quite nice. A few uh, excerpts there from what we're about to experience. So let's get on with it. We have a description of Android versus Replicant, which is from the uh, Webster's Dictionary, New International 2012. <laughs> okay, what's the definition here? Replicant, a humanoid automaton constructed of a skin flesh culture, selected... Oh, this is totally different. Selected anogeny? Uh, transfer conversion, capable of self-perpetuating self thought, paraphysical abilities developed for immigration program. Huh. So there we go. That is already quite different. So we start off with the Tyrell building, and I wonder if this is us uh, with Leon getting questioned. Let's have a look. The city is vast. Its levels deep. Its towers are tall. Monuments of stone and glass thrusting out of the perpetual smog and mist rivaled only by exploding plumes of industrial fire. And few towers stand taller or loom more monumentally than the massive pyramid which houses the Tyrell Corporation. And we're straight into the interview. Uh, what was the question again? I kind of, I'm kind of nervous when I take tests. Had an IQ test earlier this year, but nothing like this. Just pay attention, Leon. Reaction time is a factor, so answer as quickly as you can. You watch a tortoise in the desert, trapped on its back, baking in the sun, trying to turn over. It needs help, Leon, but you're not helping. Why is that, Leon? The room is large and humid since taking his place there, the big man in the work clothes has grown increasingly uncomfortable. Agitated, his interrogator coolly studies the dials on the compact machine between them, measuring, searching. Make these questions up, Mr. Holden, or do they write them down for you? What do you mean I'm not helping? They're just questions, Leon, designed to evoke an emotional response. We'll try a different one. Describe in single words only the good, thing, good things that come into your mind about your mother. My, my agitation becomes shock, rage, across the desk. Holden's hand darts inside his jacket, but Leon moves too, and despite his bulk, he is far swifter. The big man moves toward the door, then stops, and with a little smile of satisfaction, turns and fires again. Leon departs, behind him leaving destruction, and a small machine with the trade name Void Kampf, whose solitary eye-like light goes right on steadily blinking, blinking, blinking. Okay, so in the first um, seven, eight panels, we have a an abridged version of how the movie starts. That's how it ended for Holden. It began for me on the streets, with the usual rain the usual crowds, and the loudspeaker blare of a recruitment blimp somewhere above. Supervisory personnel, family makers, we need you 
The Dominguez Shimada Colony needs you. Give yourself a brand new world. If you meet health and experience qualifications for off-world immigration, we need you. Off-world is so great, how come they got to advertise? Still, it gives people a choice. Sometimes you don't have any at all. I ordered four pieces of fish, you old noodle hustler. You only gave me two. Two. Right, that. That right, Deckard. You got two. Yeah, sure, that's right. I got two. You will be required to accompany me, sir. I'm not much on Japanese or city speak or whatever you're using, pal. You want a seat? Wait your turn. This is an official request. To defy constituted authority is to flaunt the public good. He say you go with him, Deckard. You under arrest. Tell him I'm eating. Tell him he's got the wrong guy. Wrong guy, my fanny. There's only one, boogeyman. You were a Blade Runner in Force Sector. After the slaughter of the steel shop, they called you Mr. Nighttime. Captain Bryan ordered me to bring you, even if I have to serve you like sushi. But no, Bryan thinks you're hot stuff. Smartest spotter, baddest blade runner. Well, you don't look so hot to me. You don't shave, you don't dress well. That reflects on the whole department. Makes us all look bad. The skin jobs look better than you, Deckard. What's the point of wiping them out if they look better than enforcement? Pretty soon the public will want skin jobs for enforcement. I guess you'd prefer that, huh? That's why you quit? Pal, I don't understand a word you're saying. Exactly. What a jerk. If I wasn't up for promotion, I'd put this baby in a hot spin and leave your dinner all over the glass. I just shrug and keep eating my noodles and fish, watching the city flash by below. Somebody would start speaking my language soon enough at police headquarters. No need to put yourself out. I think I know my way from here. Well, I gotta say, this is very different from the movie already, uh, and it's going to be quite lengthy. We're already ten minutes in here, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read through this uh, and just kind of, wow, look at all these sections. Yeah, I'm gonna read through it, and as stuff comes up that is noticeably different from the movie, I'm gonna kind of showcase that. Okay, so interestingly, already some changes. Um, Bryant's telling Deckard all about the Nexus 6, and they talk about Roy Batty, and they actually make some references to the famous speech at the end of the film. It says up here, They used Roy Batty in every off-world conflict in the last three years. He'd flown gypsy ships with the Russians at Tannhauser Gate and been with the squadron of night-timers at the wars near Jupiter. He could handle 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit in the plutonium furnaces on the Argentine moons. He'd done deep space probes at 800 below with only a cowboy suit. Now there's an interesting bit here when um, Deckard's off to go and talk to Eldon Tyrell. They actually go into the voiceover, which is actually used somewhat successfully in this comic book. Because you got a lot of exposition that's mostly cinematic in the film. You have to do it in a way that the audience will understand. And this voiceover works rather well. It actually talks about the Nexus 3, which I find fascinating. He says here, The Nexus 3 had been too smooth, too human, if you like. I quit because of it. Retired. Now I'm back on the job, and thanks to the Ty Tyrell Corporation and good old supply and demand, we got the Nexus 6. And I got four of them all to myself. Two female, two male, and best yet, one is Roy Batty, Super Soldier. Now, it's interesting. In the movie, there is actually a slip-up, and uh, it looks like there's supposed to be five. But we've already kind of touched on Mary, the missing replicant. I'm not going to go back into that. Uh, the comic book definitely corrects that and makes it only four instead of five. Um, then we kind of follow mostly what happens in the film. There are some very interesting bits of shorthand used to get around some of the... Um, some of the scenes to, to essentially get us uh, faster in a shorter number of pages uh, to where the film uh, gets to. So interesting difference here. 
In the movie, Deckard's got a scale from the bathtub, uh, but he doesn't have that in this. All he has is the photographs to go by. And there's an interesting bit here that's totally not from the film. And along with my usual order at the noodle bar, I got some luck. Fish heads. Hey, hands, out, hands away from my dinner. It wasn't the heads that interested me, but what was on them. Scales. Fish scales. What did you expect from fish heads, dim bulb? Elephant lint? Maybe Leon's photos were a dead end, but it looked like I had those different identifiable flecks from the floor in his hotel room. Since outside of Eldon Tyrell, very few people can actually afford the real thing, my next stop was Animal Row. Well, let's go tell you anything about him? Yes. Genuine artificial manufacture. Finest quality. Perfect workmanship. Only not fish, the old lady said. Snake. Which brought me to the Egyptian. He didn't deny making it, but he claimed he couldn't remember who he sold it to. After I intensified my questioning and he still didn't remember, I believed him. He did say snakes were hot stuff with exotic dancers in the fourth sector. I ended up at Taffy's bar, tired of working and looking, Maybe of, maybe even of drinking. And then he talks to uh, Rachel in the uh, vid phone, and he meets up with Zora. Interestingly, he does do that kind of comical thing Harrison Ford did of pretending to be some sort of nerdy uh, member from the uh, Union of Variety Artists. So this is all from the movie. Very, very strange. There's um, some cutting around more dialogue than uh, I had been used to. But... Um, yeah, quite a quite an interesting change from what you get in the book. Or, sorry, in the film. There's a really nice double spread right in the center of the comic book here. So we're toward the end of the film already, and we're only halfway through the comic book, but that's because of supplemental material at the end. What does it say here? Evening comes quickly to the city. Growing out of the day's constant rain and gloom, it doesn't slow the steady spinner traffic, the perpetual harangue of advertising signs and blimps, or the relentless passage of an elevator car up the massive face of the Tyrell Pyramid. Now, this is a very interesting change down here. We're back to Deckard. It had been a long day. The night didn't promise to be any better. I was still hunting replicants, but my mind was on the one that I was hiding. Still, after the cops reported a visit Roy Batty had made yesterday, I thought I saw a pattern emerging. Now, in this, Deckard's actually talking to another member of the Tyrell Corporation. Dr. Herman Schlecht, I'm Rick Deckard, Blade Runner. Check out my badge in your vid screen. You're senior vice president of the Tyrell Corporation. Who besides Tyrell and yourself have top-level clearance in your organization? There were two. One was beyond helpful. Hannibal Chu, the object of Batty's visit, but the other, J.F. Sebastian, an apt 46751, genetic designer, age 20. I tapped out his home number on the car's vid phone. The face that came on was out of focus, but definitely familiar. Who is this? Hi, J.F. there? I'm an old friend. And then we kind of follow along what happens in the film, but it's a very interesting difference. These little inserts of characters and bits. And this part here actually confused me. We've got um, all the discussion between Roy Batty and Alden Tyrell. But what's weird is it starts with the killer kiss. And then they actually go into all the discussion about uh, EMS combination or repressor proteins. Like they, they've kind of gone backwards a little bit. And you even see... There's the kill here. Like, did they film this? Out of, did they did they do this? These bars from the comic book out of sequence. It's a little bit strange. It's a little bit weird. Anyway, so that's um, that's the end of Tyrell and Sebastian. And then we immediately cut. And I thought again, I did I miss a page? And that's what's making me think maybe this page should have been here and this page should have been here because that's more like the book. But we kind of go from you know. Uh, Roy Batty saying, I'm I'm made but not to last. And then, the light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And you it burns very, very brightly, Roy. Um, another thing. Now, this was something that I didn't... There have been a couple of bits in here that are 
quotes from the movie that this is my first time learning them. For example, there's a bit earlier on when um, Bryant discovers or talks to Deckard before he buys the drink and then they go back, he and Rachel go back to the apartment. Um, he says that that skin job you VK'd at the Tyrell Corporation. I had thought he had, I didn't really know what word he had said there, but Void Kampf, he had VK'd him. That was a line in this and I thought, oh, okay, I've learned something there. And I don't recall if this is uh, from the script or not, but it says up here, I've done questionable things, to which Tyrell says, also extraordinary things, a rebel in your time. I thought uh, J.F. Sebastian, or sorry, I thought um, Tyrell had said, and also extraordinary things, revel in your time. Is it actually a rebel in your time? Because that slightly changes the, the phrasing, but I thought that was interesting. You know, here I am learning new things about Blade Runner out of this comic book. And then, as I say, I'm reading all this stuff. I turn the page as they're talking about, you know, the light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And then we're suddenly with Deckard in uh, J.F. Sebastian's apartment. And this whole sequence continues on. I was like, did I miss a page? There's no, so, there's no showing of the death. There is reference to it, but it was a weird uh, change in the, in the bits. I thought that was kind of strange. And... As I say, because in the movie, almost all of this part is purely visual. There's almost no actual conversation. There's a few lines here and there. We do use the voiceover um, little trick to pretty good effect, I think. Then I heard the elevator. It could have been Sebastian coming home, or maybe Gaff and Bryant catching up to me again. But somehow I knew nothing was finished, and the worst has yet to come. Sure, I could have talked with him until he learned that what I had left inside, so I dropped back. And when he entered Sebastian's place, I did my best at airing Roy Batty, super soldier. It wasn't good enough. Not against his reactions, not even with surprise in my favor. Like, there's these very quick g jumps. He's not even firing his shots. We're just, it's implied. So there's a neat use of uh, not showing everything and letting the voice do all the parts. I kind of like that. I like that little factor there. And again, we've got the ending of the film here. All these bits is all done with the uh, the voiceover yellow bars here. So that's kind of nice. Some shots right out of the film here. Um, I'm going to read the final page here because it does show an interesting echoing of what's in the film and a few direct quotes, but also it's its own beast and it's, it's kind of nice. I showed the only thing I had left. My anger. I got to swear at him once, and it was all over. Except I didn't fall. For a moment, it seemed he might just be prolonging the fun. But I felt a spasming and stiffening in the hand that lifted me, and finally realized the purpose of Roy Batty's game. A last battle for the ultimate warrior. He sat down across from where he propped me. Time passed, and we stared at each other through the rain. A pigeon fluttered into his grasp. Holding it gently, he broke the silence. The things I've seen. Things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. Bright as magnesium. Sea beams glittering in the dark. Shattering blinkers at the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments. They'll be gone. Maybe he saved me to hear those memories. Maybe in my anger on the brink of death, he recognized himself. I watched him all night. It was a long, slow thing, and he fought it all the way. He took all the time he had, as though he had loved every second of it, even the pain. Then he was dead. Very similar theme to the end of the film, but very different take on the whole thing. And then, yeah, Gaff arrives and uh, Deckard meets up with Rachel. Um, I suppose we might as well just do the um, origami bit since that's kind of relevant. Let's go with... We left, Gaff's words echoing in my mind. A shame she won't last forever, but then again no one does. She didn't say anything, and neither did I. Not even about the foil sculpture unicorn I found outside the door. 
Gaff's calling card. Maybe his challenge? I headed north. She'd never seen the great outdoors. I thought she might like snow. She was curious and full of questions. Of course, there were subjects we couldn't discuss, and words we couldn't say, like death, like future. But for all that, Rachel was more alive than anyone I'd ever known. Blade Runner, you're always moving on the edge. I guess it's inevitable. Some day you'll fall on one side or the other. And that's how the comic book ends. Then uh, we have some supplementary material, you know, cast and crew and discussions about how the film was made. Very interesting stuff. But what a difference. Like, I mean, there's some stuff in here that is quite significantly altered from uh, how the how it is depicted in the film. So I'm, I'm very kind of glad I did this. I, this has been... Heck, I learned something about the VKing the the lady, you know, that that void that uh, replicant you uh, VK'd at the uh, Tyrell Corporation. That's fascinating. I really like that. I've I've done some interesting discoveries through reading this comic book. Um, so yeah, I hope you like that. That was just a little Blade Runner thing that I thought might be kind of interesting. Yeah, apologies about my god awful acting. And I was trying to echo some of the way the people spoke in the movie. I, my intention was certainly not to sound kind of insulting toward uh, people who are different parts of the world and all that. That's just the way they sounded in the film, so I was trying my best to kind of emulate it. I uh, hope that was all right. <clears throat> anyway, so there we go. That is my Blade Runner comic book, a Marvel super special from 1982. Very interesting stuff. All right. Well, until next time, we'll see you down the rabbit hole.